All right, good morning and uh, welcome to another episode of Crime Pace with Bonnie Doesn't. Today, we're a little bit inland from the coast. We're starting to see the grasses and uh, other plants reappear, reappear. It's pretty barren. The closer you get to the ocean, only getting that Wellwichia and that uh, Arthruria, that uh, member of the, uh, the amaranth family, that shrubby, succulent amaranth they see. But right now, you can see we got this very large euphorbia right here, as well as a host of other uh, perennials and grasses. Look at this, just like a giant green straw euphorb. Of course, you got those monstrous uh, locusts on it. Locusts everywhere. Look at it. Did you, are they actually eating this thing? Most euphorbia in the region are quite toxic. So this is probably producing some very toxic compounds uh, in its vasculature, as well as that milky latex. You can just see it forms this massive shrub. I mean, at least, at least 15 feet across. Let's see, is uh, how are the flowers look in there? No flowers yet, huh? Not just remnants. We saw one across the street behind a fence that had a uh, huge fruits on it, like almost golf ball sized fruits, which for euphorbia is pretty notable. Okay, here's a pretty interesting plant. This family is uh, mostly on the west side of the Atlantic in North and South America, but you get one or two disjunct species uh, on the east side of the Atlantic in the quote-unquote old world. This is Ksenia and it's a member of the family Lois Sacetum and Mazzilia family Very scabbard leaves like velcro velcro leaves You can see the leaves right there and those sepals right there those large green uh, uh, Appendages in between the five white petals uh, Harden off and the tissue dies when the, the when the flowers pollinate and they form these little helicopter uh, appendages for the fruit so the, the fruits are wind dispersed you can see there's some maturing right there so this is a Ksenia capensis and I you get one other uh, species in this family that you get in uh, in uh, Arabia in the Middle East look at all the hairs on it all the trichomes and again Menzelia you get uh, Loasa in South America and a few other genera you get uh, Menzelia and a few other, uh, Menzelia, Euchneid, etc. Uh, in North America. So Ksenia capensis, Velcro-like leaves. It, you know, I think it's uh, theorized that this, being such a disjunct, you know, the mo most of the families on the west side of the Atlantic in uh, the quote-unquote New World in the Neotropics, but, you know, this species and that one other one are uh, are on the African continent. I believe it's estimated that that uh, dispersal event happened, I think I read like Oligocene, maybe maybe longer, maybe Eocene, maybe 40 million years ago. So after the comet knocked out the dinosaurs, but uh, you know, pretty uh, a pretty good amount of time after the age of mammals got started, you know? Look at that, and of course you just look at the hairs on the goddamn stem, look at that. I've seen this down in South Africa too, you get it in northern south africa in the northern cape but a pretty remarkable plant because it's the only member of its family in this region and again you get one other species up in a, up in the middle east yeah i can't get over how much plant life there is here compared to where Wellwichia grows on the coast i guess that that cold air those cold ocean currents and all that cold air just keep the rain away assuming most of the rain comes from the east when it does come maybe you get some storms coming from the west but look at all the grass. No, no grass where Wellwichia grows. Just totally barren. Much less diversity. And no euphorbia over there either. So we're, again, further inland where it's much hotter and there's not as much fog. And of course, the closer to the coast you get, there's more fog. There's some nice trash too. Okay, so here we are just uh, going on down a road towards the mountain range. We come upon a giant succulent milkweed in uh, full flower and uh, fruit. You can see there's those uh, follicles maturing right there and uh, right there are those flowers. So you can see these flowers just uh, acting like a little uh, radar dish uh, for flies, for the flies that will pollinate them. You can see it kind of looks, looks pretty gross, like a hairy inflamed butthole. Oh, that's terrible. And... Uh, Right here, as you can see, typical milkweed seeds. A little seed with a coma on it. The coma is the word for that fluff. So pretty incredible. I've never seen, you know, I saw hoodia in South Africa, but I, I have not seen, 
I have not seen this species nor one so large. Again, look at the look at those inflorescences. Look at it. These haven't opened yet. It's the giant radar dish. How does it smell? Let's see. Oh, it smells somewhat sweet. Somewhat rancid, but somewhat sweet as well. Look at it. Oh yeah, that's that's pretty horrible. Doesn't that look gross? That's what all the stapeliads do. Of the Asclepiadoid subfamily of the Oleander family, Apocynaceae. Look at that massive bastard. Look at it. Just spiny, succulent stems with those uh, protuberances. Little tubercles with spines on them. Holy hell. Oh, what do we got here growing on this nice rocky ledge, this nice rocky outcropping? It's a species of croton, Croton gratissimus. All right, we get over 600 species of croton, quite a few in North America as well. This one is pretty common and widespread throughout Central Africa. Look at the silvery luster, the silvery sheen on the abaxial surfaces of those leaves due to the scale-like trichomes. The leaves emit a pleasant fragrance, a very sweet smell, and uh, the leaves also have some interesting secondary chemistry here. So there's some good pharmacological uh, importance here in some of those uh, secondary metabolites produced by this plant. Poinsettia family, Euphorbiaceae. All right, this one's pretty interesting too, all right? From a genus known as tropical almonds, this is Terminalia pruneoides from the family Combrataceae from the order Myrtales, same order as guava and eucalyptus, all right? Many of these species are edible. There's over 300 species in the genus. You can see those distinct red fruits right there, almost looking uh, kind of papering with this, like a little flake. But now ascending this uh, small nook in a canyon, look at the grain size. Oh, look at that piece of shit right there. I wonder if that's a baboon or what. Look at the grain size in this uh, plutonic rock, this intrusive igneous rock. Must have taken a very long time to cool. So we're just gonna step over to shit right there and look up here and check out this massive succulent member of the grape family in the genus Cyphostema. Look at that. Nice pack of corm trunk. Massive bastard right here. Sclerophyllous coriaceous leaves. No flowers or fruits, unfortunately. But a member of Vitaceae, the grape family. All right, I was able to shimmy up that rock, and uh, here we go. Look at that succulent peeling bark. The trunk's got to be, I don't know, four feet diameter. And there's those leaves. Hey, let me let me see if I can get up here without breaking my ass. So they got to put a handicap ramp up here. Let's start complaining. Who am I write a letter to management? Get, I'm gonna go all out, Karen. <sighs> Jesus, just coming up amidst the granite boulders. So Cyphostema is a genus of giant succulent grape. Quite a few species in it, very ecologically successful in uh, southern Africa. You could see this one, Cyphostema cororii. It's about, I don't know, four foot diameter breast height. You can see there's a missing trunk right there. Uh, and uh, upwards to 20 feet tall. Whole plant probably weighs, I don't know, the size of a pickup truck. Got uh, those coriaceous leaves, very leathery leaves, stiff and sclerophyllous. And again, a member of the grape family, Vitaceae. But you get, you get a giant pack of corm trunk like that, could store all that water. You're freed from the constraints of living in a seasonally dry, very hot environment. We're so close to the equator here, we're at about 20 degrees south latitude in western Namibia. So the, per square inch, the sun's intensity is a bit stronger down here. And uh, if you got a rainy season, you got a dry season. The winters are very dry, so this guy might even uh, end up dropping his leaves and just going drought deciduous if need be. But again, it's got so much water stored in that trunk that might not even be necessary. Okay, this is bizarre to see. This looks like a Thamnosma. It's certainly a member of that family, Rutaceae. You can see those pellucid oil glands, but uh, the fruit looking like a little ass looks identical to Thamnosma. I wonder if it's in the same genus. Got, uh, looks like got triffid leaves right there. And of course it smells pretty pungent like most members of Rutaceae to citrus family do, but uh, no flowers, just fruits. You can see it's right there, just a, I don't know, maybe a three quarters of a meter tall. Wonder who's living under that rock right there. Look at that, somebody's living under there. And this right here is a member of Baraginaceae, of the genus Codon. So there's the two species, possibly three. There's a third one that grows uh, in Namibia that uh, is as yet unidentified. 
But uh, this is coat on Schenkia. You can see the flowers are not quite ready yet, but you can see those bracts. So Boraginaceae is the family here. And what it's done is basically take trichomes, which the family is notorious for. A lot of Boraginaceae have very stiff little trichomes. And it's uh, turned them into, uh, it's basically accentuated them into little spines that cover the leaves and the stems. Because again, herbivory is a huge selection pressure here and has been for millions of years uh, on the African continent. So uh, they're not filled with anything so far as I know. They're not stabbing me now as uh, you know you would get with uh, Nidus scolus, the member of the Forbiaceae. But, uh, but they are impressive. They do put out a punch visually at least. Again, there's that flower. Not quite ready to come out yet. Look, it's a species of hibiscus. And like many members of uh, the Malvaceae, they've got very stiff, uh, stiff hairs, kind of like fiberglass. Stellate trichomes, they're called. Except these, when those fruits are mature, and I was just touching one over there, uh, the hairs stick in you. They feel like they literally feel like fiberglass. Here's an open fruit capsule. Flowers are done. I've, I've never seen a mallow with uh, or a hibiscus with this stiff of hairs. So you get the epicalyx, those little bracts that subtend the ovary. But again, those those fucking hairs are brutal. Look at it. They're sticking to me. Almost like glockids on a prickly pear. Yes, everything, everything sticks to you here. Look at that. More sticky plants. More sticky hitchhiking plants than anywhere else I've been. Probably has something to do with the the uh, large amount of megafauna in the area. Holy shit, is it that? Look, it's a superfood. The same genus that was marketed as a superfood. Maybe that was going on five or six years ago. That was a long time ago, so. I haven't seen it recently. But it's a plant in the genus Moringa. So the order is Brassicales, but it's in its own family. Whew, I am out. Nice little bottle tree. Fucking out of breath getting up here. Quite an excursion. Big old bastard. With the pack of corn trunk nice. You see, you got the pinnate leaves to make you think it's a pea, but it's uh, more closely related to mustard. Of course, that succulent trunk. Massive bastard, massivebastards.com. And when the fruits uh, mature, they just look like legumes too. They look like long pea pod looking things. All right, now this plant right here, though it looks like hell and it looks nondescript, something you'd probably just ignore, looks dead. It's probably one of the most interesting that I've seen so far, uh, aside from Mowichi in the last few days, right? This is a member of the order Gunnerales, which is, uh, the same order as the plant Gunnera, the plant genus Gunnera. If you don't know the plant genus Gunnera, I'll put a little piece up on the screen right now. It's it's basically a, a more quote-unquote basal plant lineage, an earlier branching lineage of angiosperm. It uh, looks weird as hell, giant leaves. They call it Chilean rhubarb. It's mostly southern hemisphere. Uh, it's invasive in the UK, but it's just a, a really bizarre plant Gunnera is. And Gunnera is a dioecious plant, so plants are either male or female. This is the only other genus in uh, the order Gunnerales, and this is Mirothamnus. This plant is also dioecious. We have a male right here and a female right there. Most interesting about this plant is that it's it's uh, something called poikilohydric, which means it, like the resurrection fern, Selaginella lepidophila, it can completely dry out but not die. So these leaves that we're looking at right here are all rolled up. You got the staminate flowers, staminate inflorescences, and leaves. Those leaves are all rolled up, but they're not dead. If you were to cut a branch of this off and put it in a cup of water, uh, six to eight hours later, those leaves would green up and uh, unfurl and start fo actively photosynthesizing. So, I mean, that alone, it's its just, I don't know how that something like that even evolves, but there you go. Only two species in the genus, one on uh, the mainland African continent and one in Madagascar. And this is Mirothamnus flabellifolius. So this is a male plant and you can see Right there, you got those uh, staminate inflorescences again, very tiny. And then over here, this is a female plant, and uh, those are the uh, carpels on there. Let's see if we can uh, get in there. There you go. 
See that? So there's seed in there. So those are the female flowers, female inflorescences. Plants are either male or female. You know, whereas most angiosperms have perfect flowers, uh, you know, having both male and female parts, dioecious plants are either strictly male or female. And you can see there's a little colony of this Merothamnus right here, just occupying all the nooks and crannies of this rock. Got some over here too. But you just pass it, I mean, if they're not actively photosynthesizing, and just ignore it. It's, you'd think it was dead, but it's not. It's just dormant. It's just waiting for uh, waiting for some rain, waiting for some moisture. Pretty weird. Not many poikilohydric plants, especially among angiosperms. There's plenty of poikilohydric uh, bryophytes, but when you get the flowering plants, it's a rare trait. I think there's a poikilohydric cactus in the Bolivian Andes too, but uh, just coming up right here, I think the elevation is probably, I don't know, 2,000 feet, something like that, maybe a little higher, in western Namibia. You also get it in uh, the eastern part of Africa at about the same uh, same latitude we're at right now. Anyway, there you go, Merothamnus flabellifolia. Okay, you schmuck, that's about it for the video, but first we're going to show you what happens when you put this plant in water, when you bring it back to life. The resurrection plant of Namibia. Okay, this is pretty cool. I brought this back as an herbarium specimen. Legally, you don't need a permit for dried, pressed plants. Brought it back as an herbarium specimen. Got it cleared through customs and all this shit. Gonna voucher it. But I snipped a little piece off just to do an experiment and see if I can indeed bring it back to life. And four hours ago, I did just that. I put it in, in this pint glass of water. If not four hours later, you could see it's just coming right back to life, actively photosynthesizing and metabolizing. And those leaves just sprung back to life from their dry brown state and they're, they're verdant green and doing their thing. It's got no roots, as you can see. All right, maybe you could put rooting hormone on it, hormone on it then a... Uh, and root it, but I'm not going to do that. I just want to see if I could get it to do its thing or not, you know. So there you go. Back from the dead, the resurrection plant of Namibia, all right? Incredible. Incredible evolutionary adaptation to a seasonally dry environment. It's like I go fuck you, so bye.